Bridge is an acronym for books recycled to instruct, disciple, guide, and educate. We firmly believe that reading is critical for Christians to grow in their faith, and so we strive to make Bibles and gospel-based Christian books available at very affordable prices. Our purpose is to share the glorious good news of Jesus Christ through written and spoken word. We do this by providing resources and educational opportunities for people to grow in their knowledge of biblical truth so that they are equipped to share that truth with others. You can visit our website at bridgebookstexas.org where you can find our reformed podcast, Bridge Radio, where we bring on Christian authors, apologists, and scholars such as Dr. James White, Dr. John Frame, Joe Beaky, Jeff Durbin, John Sampson, and Tim Trumpert. You can find Bridge Radio on iTunes, Android, Windows, and Google Play or stream via our website. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Romans 1 verses 20, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And welcome back to another episode of Bridge Radio, coming at you from the great state of Texas. Texas. Uh Uh-oh, as always, the AW sitting right across from me and to the right of me. Who do we have here? <laughs> <laughs> we have Steve. <laughs> the we whole, got Steve. How yeah, you doing? The whole the, the boss of this whole shebang, and uh, we're here proclaiming the gospel fearlessly and faithfully. As always, I am your host, Julio Mod Rodriguez, and uh, today we got another excellent episode for you. We're continuing. God's Crime Scene. Uh, we had a, our, our guest on, uh, episode 18. He's the author of a book titled God's Crime Scene. And, and and not only does he appear on episode 18, but he also appears on our episode number two. <laughs> oh, wow. And that was on uh, Cold Case Christianity, oh, his book right. about the resurrection. Excellent podcast. It's definitely one of our most listened to. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. and so we're continuing uh, not only having him on the show, but as well uh, continuing the series, um, just because I, I really, really thoroughly enjoy his his book. Last mm-hmm. time we talked about causation, talked about DNA as well, the complexity yep. of DNA as an evidence for the existence of God. And uh, today we're going to be talking about design. So I'm super, super excited. But uh, let me uh, first wait and I'll introduce our guests in a little bit. But if you're a new listener, please subscribe. Uh, we're on all platforms that you get your podcasts on iTunes, Android, Windows, Google Play. And we are also excited to actually have. The Bridge app, finally. It's here. It's it's finally. here. It is finally here. It's I know live. I've mentioned it so many times, but it's finally here. And uh, Steve, you want to take it away? Just let, let our listeners know about the app. We got so much for you guys to check out on the app. We got uh, our current events are on there. So if you want to know what's going on at Bridge, just check it out. We got a calendar. You can uh, see what's going on month by month, week by week. We have Bible studies on there, and you can register for Bible studies actually through the app. You, you can, can see a description of a full description of what we've got going on we've got sermons lots of uh yes. reformed expository experiential <laughs> sermons on there now so uh we've got like trumper we've got uh samson, samson yep samson, yeah. expository got... sermons through entire books of the bible exactly. our, our goal is to put up the whole entire new testament so right now we got ephesians mark john uh oh yeah and the book of john is done by uh the response church out in san diego yeah, they right. did a whole 72 series <laughs> expository sermons through the book the gospel of john so yeah lots to listen to there we got articles we've got book reviews statement of faith and last but not least our podcast so yeah. check out all the podcasts that we've done so far and also we have the uh the way magazine mm-hmm. and in spanish el camino so uh those are both written by uh tim trumper mm-hmm. and uh just does an excellent job engaging awesome. current culture and uh, from a biblical worldview. So check it out. Yeah, definitely. Go check out our past podcasts as well. I mean, we've had you know the top Christian scholars, theologians, and apologists on, uh, including John Frame, James White, Joel Beakey, Rosario Butterfield, and the guy that we have on today. So let me go ahead and uh, 
and uh, introduce him. Our guest is a renowned Christian apologist and author of three books that I highly recommend uh, that you have in your library. The titles are Cold Case Christianity, Forensic Faith, and the book that we'll be discussing today, which is God's Crime Scene. Uh, he is a cold case homicide detective, popular national speaker. Uh, he has been featured on Dateline, Fox News, Court TV, and, and he actually comes from a three-generation law enforcement family. Mm-hmm. And once again, my dear brother, uh, thank you back. Thank you for coming back on to Bridge Radio Jay Warner Wallace. I'm really glad to be with you guys. I'm looking at your app right now. I'm just wondering what it will take. What will you give me if I give this a five star rating? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to bribe you guys. We, we can work something out. out. We'll, send you, yeah. we'll send you some bridge money. We can work some out. Yeah, exactly. You, you, right, right. Even right. though you come from a lot. Good, yeah, and, even. And I, thought, I will say this you've used perhaps one of the best app developers that's out there for this kind and a lot of the mm-hmm. groups yeah. that we are working with uh, have used the same developer you know a lot of the good apologetics groups that we work with mm. have used this developer so that's always a good sign when you're you know you start off by you know doing your best to, to use good uh, developers i can't even afford the developer that you are using okay so i'm a little bit jealous <laughs> Sorry, just so you know. awesome so. well write a review i would i, I would I, that would be awesome that would be, that would be great you got it, you got it. <laughs> that was a lot of hard work it but was. It, yeah. I know. You can, you can tell it is. But it's, it's not just that. It's just that, that people don't realize what, how expensive it is to the it is. the actual organization to continue to, to develop and provide an app on a monthly basis, right? Mm-hmm. So our, our hope is that when we provide an app like this, the people will actually, you know, press it into service. Mm-hmm, yeah. uh, and it, it, this is a, a crowded, busy, noisy world. I mean, there's a lot of other things out there competing for our attention. So we, mm-hmm. we want to at least be one of those voices that are being heard on the Internet and being heard on, on, on mobile platforms. So Absolutely. it's good. Absolutely. All good. Hey, yep. Jay, how, how many years do you get for bribing a police officer? See? <laughs> yeah, you get a lot. But, then, but then, then remember, you only get a lot if you get caught doing it. So oh, okay. okay. All right. We'll be sure after this podcast, we'll, we'll go ahead and hand you. All right. Well, you're not a police officer anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't count. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. yeah exactly. Unfortunately, though, I'm part of this, this three-generation family. Like, yeah, you got a reputation to work on cases. So, so I have to uh, uphold the standard, you know? So. Right. Right, right. So, so how has it been since the last time we've uh, we've spoken with you? Since you were on the program, uh, anything new? Yeah. Well, it, you know, I'm working on a new book with uh, Sean McDowell, uh, nice. which is really focused on how to teach uh, worldview and, and Christian apologetics to Gen Z, which are our high schoolers right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, this has been, you know, a fun project. We're back and forth every day working on chapters. So, it'll come out next year, and that's what we're working on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the meantime, it's just you know, you have a, you have a speaking schedule, and you're trying to trying to, you know, do all the things. There's a couple of cases I still want to finish at work, so I've got to, you know, kind of balance. Spinning a lot of plates, let's put it that way. Hmm. Spinning a lot of plates, but it's Uh, all good. Exciting. You can do it. You can do it. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and jump into the topic of today. Um, Like I said, I really highly recommend for... Um, those of you who don't know Jay Warner Wallace, to go, you know, check out some of his lectures, his uh, his his uh, his books, yes. uh, Cold Case Christianity, Forensic Faith, and definitely the book that we're going to be discussing today, God's Crime Scene, and we're going to be talking about design specifically. Yeah. Uh, so, Jim, in chapter four of your book, you begin with a story of a criminal who used an instrument he created for the murder of his ex girlfriend, uh, known as a Garrett. I think I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, quickly tell us about the story, and more importantly, how can we use this story as a Springboard for evidence of an intelligent designer. Well, it, uh, it's called a garrote, by the way, but garrot. it's a strangulation device. So it was left at the mm. crime scene. And look, a lot of what we do yeah, when we talk about what is the cause, we, we walk into a room. We're not sure if it's just a death, a natural death, an accidental, a suicide, or a homicide. We're trying to figure out, you know, is there any evidence at the scene that will define this, that will give us an idea that the cause is in fact a personal cause other than the victim. So, so we're looking for things like that. So imagine just to make it simpler, because a lot of your audience probably doesn't know what a garrote looks like. Uh-huh. But what if I just found um, uh, the, next to a, a, the body, I found a, a, a stick, but the stick had been sharpened in a way at, the, at one end, uh, and you could see the knife marks on the stick that, that actually were used to sharpen the stick, and of course it's covered in blood and it's sitting next to the body. Now the question is, should I look at that stick and, and, and consider it a designed weapon? Because like, you, know, you could argue that if, if, let's say it happens outside, there's lots of sticks outside, it could just be a stick. He could have fallen accidentally on the stick. Right, I mean, mm-hmm. but, the, but the question is: Is there anything about the stick itself that tells us this is just a, not an artifact of nature or an accident 
caused by some set of natural uh, processes, but is it instead a designed weapon. Hmm. And of course, you know, in our case, this garrote was lying next to the body of our victim, and the, the, right away the officers got there and they said, hey, we're going to collect that. That's important. And if you saw the stick that was sharpened, you would probably say, well, I should probably collect that because that's important. Why? Because you see it as a, a kind of a, a designed artifact, which means that you have an artisan or a designer that is ultimately responsible for the design, and that's going to be your suspect. So a lot of what we do at crime scenes and trying to figure out, is this thing left at the crime scene, a designed weapon, will help us to determine if aspects of our world, especially in the biological realm, right, with all the micro-machines and molecular machines that exist in biology, all the structures that are designed, and well, I don't want to say designed yet, but are, are, are built from proteins of a specific shape and size, those themselves are built from amino acids. And how these proteins come together like Legos to build these little molecular machines, we've got to make a decision. Are the attributes that we would say, hey, that's not just a stick, that's a design weapon. Are those attributes also present in the molecular machinery of our bodies? Because if they are, then if you're saying, hey, this looks more like a design from an intelligent designer who designed the stick to be a weapon by shaving its end, well, that's a very simple thing, by the way. Just a very simple thing. It looks a lot like a stick, with the, the only difference is a shaved end. But that's still enough. That one little thing is enough for you to say, mm, no, that, that looks purposeful. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's what I was trying to do in this chapter, is to say to myself, what are the attributes of design that we either consciously or subconsciously recognize anytime we look at any object and assess it? that we would say, okay, the, the most reasonable inference is design. And people have been trying to do this, by the way, for a number of years, uh, either philosophers or scientists mm -hmm. or, um, you know, uh, bi biochemists have offered different... Uh, I actually look at it completely different because I'm looking at a... I'm a cumulative case guy. Mm -hmm. This is how I build my cases in front of juries. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's always going to be... Do I have more than one good reason? One, one could be enough, by the way. One of these attributes of design could be enough. But, okay. but if you've got several attributes of design, then I think that you've you got to make a, the mo the commit, a commitment to the most reasonable inference. Mm -hmm. And it's that collective, cumulative case that's so powerful. Sure. Wow. You, in your book, you use the, the uh, word designed as an acronym, an eight-characteristic uh, acronym for... Uh, for uh, to make a reasonable inference for an argument for design. Can you explain that acronym to us? Okay, well, first of all, that's a stupid acronym. Okay? <laughs> I didn't want to use that acronym. Okay? I, just had a, I just had a list of eight things that I, I always see in, in uh, objects that are designed. And I, I, I ran the book by my buddy Frank Turek, um, who's an apologist. And Frank is one of these guys who, if it doesn't have an acronym, you can, <laughs> but there's no point in even talking about it unless there's an acronym. <laughs> so, so he said, Jim, you got to make an acronym out of this. And it turns out there's enough letters to make the word design. Sure. But, you know, if you have to use adjectives and adverbs and all kinds of crazy words in order to get your acronym, it's, mm. you're probably cheating, right? <laughs> so I had to do that in order to make this work. So I would just disregard <laughs> the acronym, but look at the attributes. Because, look, for me, this is a passion because uh, my, my bachelor's degree is in design and my mm. master's degree is in architecture and mm. then I became a, a detective. Mm. So my background is in design. Sure. And, and, I, and I know if you looked at any of my work, either when I was in art school, if it's painting or it, whatever it may be, uh, uh, charcoal, whatever medium I'm using, you would not think that those are, a set, those are the result of just physics and chemistry and the raw materials. You would right. say, no, there's a, an intelligent mind that drew that, or that painted that, or that designed that. And that's what we're looking at here. And those attributes are pretty simple, right? Number one, I called it dubious probability, but really the point is, could chance alone get it done? Because if chance alone can get it done, what's the point in talking about? Right. If the if the twig just came off the tree, the stick just came off the tree, and it looks like it's got a broken edge, and it's still got some leaves stuck to it, it looks like the, the, the branches that are in the tree, if chance alone, uh, in that case, it would be wind factors also. But let's just say chance alone, it happens to break off the tree, well, then there's no point looking at it as a, as a designed object. So if chance alone can explain it, then we're out. But if chance is, seems incredibly, uh, and by the way, most of these molecular machines we look at in the human body, mm. even the physicists and, and the, uh, the uh, biochemists and the, uh, the biologists do not look at them as having been formed by chance. They would say some guidance is necessary. That's the first thing. Right. The second thing is, if it looks like something you know is designed, if it resembles something, 
So this thing kind of resembles a, you know, a, a knife or a poker or something that you have seen other examples of this in the designed world. So when you see this one, you think, well, it looks a lot like something else I've seen. Uh, that I know it's designed. So that echo of familiarity, that the fact that it looks familiar to you, you recognize it as being similar to something else that you know is designed, then why wouldn't you infer that this is designed? Mm -hmm. That's the second element you have to consider. Third is you have to look at the level of sophistication and intricacy involved in the design. So, for example, the stick is very unsophisticated. My garrote, however, was relatively sophisticated. Mm -hmm. The way the ends are those two pieces of wood, each about four inches long, a center hole drilled at the center point of each dowel. This, they were wooden dowels, little round you know, uh, poles that were cut to four inches in length. A mm -hmm. center hole was drilled in the middle of those dowels. The dowels had been sanded in a certain way. Even the rough edges on the end of the cut had been sanded. Then you had the wire strung between these two dowels and tied off in a particular kind of knot. There was a level of sophistication right. there that you would say. And by the way, back in this, this, uh, this crime occurred in 1979. And when back in the day, when the officers worked this case, they had been familiar with uh, what garrots were, because not because we've seen them in our work. I've never seen a garrot since. I never saw a garrot before this case. Mm -hmm. But I had watched The Godfather, and in The Godfather, <laughs> there were two garrot murders, and those two garrot murders, they used a garrot look just like this. And we know those are design weapons. Why wouldn't we think this is a design weapon? Right. right. So it's a part of that echo of familiarity plus the the sophistication involved of the way it's, it's put, how can chance get, if I put the wire in the two wooden dowels in a drawer and I open and close it a billion times, will it ever come out looking like that? Mm -hmm. No, because there's something more than just chance. The, the fourth thing is, is it informationally dependent? So maybe the guy who did this murder had seen The Godfather. And I've seen how effective that murders, the murders in The Godfather, of course, they always make them look easier than they really are. <laughs> but he thought, hey, I can do a silent killing using this design weapon that I had seen someplace else. When you're building something on the basis of information, that is a good, uh, a good inference then that this is a designed object. The sure. fifth thing is goal direction. Hmm. Do you know, does this thing speak of what its goal or its purpose is? Because that means being there's a purpose in the mind of the creator, because physics and chemistry and raw materials don't have purpose like this. And For example, if you wanted this just to cut um, wax or to cut clay or to cut cheese, these things are available on the market. You can buy these kinds of cutters. Mm -hmm. They don't involve heavy-duty wooden dowel handles, though. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of handles tell me that whatever this guy was going to use this for, he thought he was going to be applying incredible pressure, incredible pull to the handles. He didn't want to cut his fingers. He knew they had to be really sturdy. I can tell you something about the purpose of this tool based on its construction. And when, this, when you see that kind of goal direction, you, the best inference is mind. Here's another uh, mm -hmm. attribute of design. It's the, it's the sixth that I use on the list. And that is that you can you explain it with simply raw physics? Is there some type of natural uh, inexplicability? So, so again, if I put it in the drawer and I, I open and close the drawer a billion times, if it isn't chance that puts the wire to the wood, would there be some law of physics that would naturally attract the wire through the small hole to wrap back around and tie a knot? Hmm. You know, physics won't get that done. So the better explanation is design. Two more. Uh, well, I call this efficiency or irreducible complexity. This is what Michael B. he has talked about in some of the mi uh, micro machines, the micro machines that he's identified. This idea that if you have to have a series of elements together in a particular shape or in a particular relationship before the object is functional, well, that's very hard to explain under an evolutionary model because evolution says we have one mutation. If the mutation benefits the organism, it's passed on to its offspring. We have more of these in the environment, and it's one mutation at a time that complex structures are built. Well, if that's the case and you have a device that has, say, 10 proteins that are put together in a specific play, a way to be functional in the machine, the question then becomes, how did we get from zero to 10? Mm -hmm. What was it that right. the one protein thing, how did that benefit the organism? Mm -hmm. How did the two protein mutation benefit the organism? We have to have a genetic pathway, a molecular pathway from zero to 10 to explain how this evolved slowly over time. The better explanation when you see an irreducibly complex object, you know, I use a mousetrap in the book because 
could be he used a mousetrap to explain this. Mousetraps are irreducibly complex to six pieces. Hmm. That's hard to explain unless somebody is there as a designer to put all six pieces together in that way. Last thing, of course, is do is there any sense in which this uh, this object was used as a matter of choice? In my crime scene, it's clear where she, where my victim lived. She was right across a, a very thin wall of, of, of drywall from two other tenants, and our killer did not want to wake up the other tenants, which is why he thought this device would get the job done quietly. He could have stabbed her. He could have shot her. He could have done a number number of other things that would have caused either her to scream or caused a lot of noise in the room. Right. None of which he wanted. He want is clear this choice he was using here. He chose this unusual device because it was the one device he thought was appropriate for the setting. When you have a clear expression of decision making, you have a good inference that a designer is involved. Okay, so here's my point. I just gave you eight aspects, eight attributes that I think make up a cumulative case for design. And that's why when we see an object at a crime scene, and a lot of us are just doing this unconsciously, we are assessing it under these, I can't think of a ninth attribute of design. And that's what I tried to do in this Mm -hmm. chapter, is to think of every available attribute as me as a designer. I I have been a designer. I've I've designed things. Even in this drawing, I'm designing the drawing to show you about design. So, so these are all my drawings. So, so the, 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 the point is, what is it that is, is, is native, that is obvious about design, and then could we apply this to biological structures? And if we did, would we have good reason to believe they're designed? Mm-hmm. Now, there's different styles of garrots. Is that true? Um, I, I'm just, uh, I know that the yes. there's different types have really long wood, wooden handles so that you can get the leverage on there to twist it because of the... And there's one in, that goes from the back and also the front. I didn't. I, I yeah, was just curious. Yeah. I was just curious because it's just an interesting piece of. Uh, yeah, no, there are. And as a matter of fact, uh, I will tell you that this uh, just on an aside, my killer in this case built a very unusual garage that gave him away. And here's why I mean I say that because he used a, t- a wooden dowel that used to be blue. We found microscopic specks of blue paint in the wooden dowel. He had, mm-hmm. he had uh, um, sanded him off so that so you couldn't see that the, the blue paint was there. Mm-hmm. Maybe he thought it would eventually come back to a source and he didn't want the source being identified. Mm-hmm. So he tried to sand off all the paint. Two, he used a very unusual piece of wire. In fact, it was so thin, he doubled it up. And he doubled it because he was afraid it was too thin to get the job done. Mm-hmm. He was using what is known as number one eight-strand picture-hanging wire. It's a small, uh, not braided, either braided or twisted multi-strand wire that is used to hang pictures, okay? But it's so thin, number one, that most people don't even buy it. I, I did some research on this when I made the case. Hmm. Only about 4% of the picture hanging wire market is this number one. Most people, if they bought picture hanging wire, they buy thicker wire. Now, what's interesting about that is why would he use, well, clearly, he didn't think it was strong enough. Why not just get the right size wire? Why not just start off with a dowel that's that's not got blue paint on it? Well, that told me something. That told me that this guy, and this is unsolved for 35 years, this guy this guy was using what was available to him. Because mm-hmm. clearly if he was going to go out and buy something from scratch, he just would have bought an unpainted dowel, and he would have bought the right size wire. But, you know, he decided to use something he had access to. And it wasn't perfect, so he doubled it up. Now that tells me, okay, so I want to know one thing. Where's this guy living at the time of the murder? Because whatever he, wherever he's living, that's where these materials came from. Because he's just using what he has access to. Hmm. He's not going out and buying this from scratch, or he buys something different. Right. So I went that back and did a search warrant on his mother's house, hmm. where he was living in 1979 at the time of the crime. He was 27 years old at the time. And what do I find there? I find that she is a painter. She's been painting for 40 years. And what do you think she hangs her pictures with? Hmm. doubled up number one strand picture hanging wire why she picked that i don't know (laughs) and what does she use to to lock up her sliding glass doors she takes old brooms cuts off the broom handle and throws them in the sliding glass door track and that locks her doors in place so he had access to exactly the material he needed to make this garage if i asked all of you guys go home tonight and make a garage but you can only use stuff that's available to you that you're willing to destroy Mm -hmm. well tomorrow you all come back with three different kinds of garages Mm -hmm. none of them would be this garage because i defy that any of you has got number one picture hanging wire in your house (laughs) (laughs) okay but you'd bring something back you'd use rope you'd use guitar strings i don't know what you would use okay but you would use something and that would tell me something about your house 
and what's available to you. Mm. But none of you would come back with this. This is the only guy, I think, who could come back with this. He's one of a rare few who had access to the right material. So, yeah, that, that was part of how we solved the case. And the only reason why I asked Jay is that we see this guy, he's designing something for a specific purpose, and that's why I wanted yep. to tie back to that, right. what you were just talking about. It's like, yes, this guy yes, was he, specific yep. in what he wanted to do, and it just didn't just happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, so this is a good example of, of, of choice reflection. He's, he had choices for even how he would build the garage. And all of those tell us something about it. Whenever when they speak, they scream designer, and they yeah. even tell us something about the designer. Sure. So then if you turn a corner and you say, okay, what if we applied this to other things in our quote-unquote natural environment? Like, for example, in the book I offer the example of a, a bird's nest. What if we just said, okay, uh, you look at a bird's nest. How do you know that intelligent birds uh, design that nest? Why wouldn't you believe that the wind just blew this in place? Well, it right. just applied this template we just talked about. This will give you, and you might even say that some of the pieces of the template don't seem obvious to you. Like maybe let's say irreducible complexity. What is irreducibly complex about a bird's nest? Well, if you don't think that they're there, throw them out. You don't need all eight things to infer design. Are you going to say because you don't see a couple of these attributes, this is no longer designed by a bird? Mm-hmm. No, I think you're going to say it's still designed by a bird, even though I can only find four, five, six of the attributes we've just described. Right. Now when we turn the corner and we go to what Michael Behe has kind of made as a poster child for the entire ID movement and intelligent design movement, he pointed out over 20 years ago this little molecular motor in bacteria that's called a flagellum motor. Mm-hmm. And it's basically a rotary engine, okay, that is... A, a motorized it is the the rotor is twisted by an electrical charge in a bunch of proteins that circle the base of the rotor hmm. and if you look at it you just think to yourself how in the world could we not infer design from this yeah. all of the attributes we've just talked about are present in that bacterial uh, that little motor and as a matter of fact it looks just like rotary engines that we have been building for years. Mm. And we didn't even discover this bacterial flagellum until years after we were building those rotary engines. We didn't steal that design from the bacteria. Wow. That design uh, we were using un- uh, unknown to, to that it actually existed for years before we ever discovered it. So it was only discovered in the 70s. So I would say that if you look at those attributes we just talked about and you just applied them to several, you know, and, and B, he has done a great job. He's got a new book coming out, by the way, which is going to be even more awesome. But uh, he's a biochemist from Lehigh University, and he's super smart. And and people have tried to attack his inferences related to irreducible complexity and mm-hmm. the bacterial flagellum for 20 years. And when, you're, when your argument stands after 20 years of assault, <laughs> I think you've got a pretty good argument. Yeah. And I think right. so, now I've gone a little further because I don't think it's just irreducible complexity. I think it's the other seven things and irreducible complexity that tell me that that there's a great cumulative case for design in the bacterial flagellum. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any more uh, examples of what cumulative case, uh, cumulative case uh, for intelligent uh, design, Jay? Well, what, and so Michael's got like, you know, blood clotting. There's a lot of system work also, which is much more difficult to illustrate. So I just use the one illustration. So a lot of times it's biological systems that are, are, are irreducibly complex. That rec- well, Look at it this way. It's, uh, there's always this chicken and egg problem. Let's just go back to the simplest of things. Mm-hmm. Um, your proteins in your body are the building blocks, the little building blocks uh, for every molecular machine from your cells in your cells. All these are built with proteins. Mm-hmm. Now, wh- how do we get proteins? Well, proteins are built from amino acids. And where are they built? They're built in these little machines in your body called ribosomes. The ribosomes in your body... They turn, they, they take the amino acids and construct them into proteins. The problem, though, is the ribosome machine itself is built with what? Proteins. Mm-hmm. So the problem you have is you've got a machine that's required to build proteins, but the problem is you have to have proteins before you can get the machine. <laughs> and, and this is the, so you see these, yeah. these things that just scream design right. um, in all of biological structures. And the question is, you know, look, could I, let me, I always put it this way. It's not as though there's not enough evidence to right. reasonably infer that God exists. There is. Mm-hmm. But there's also enough wiggle room for people to, to deny that God exists. And, and, and you'll, you'll, it takes a lot more complexity sometimes. The, the explanations, I think, are much less satisfying. But it's possible to construct an entirely naturalistic explanation. I just don't think it works. But people do it all the time. Now, why would God 
not be more obvious. Well, this is how like, every criminal case I've ever worked has gone. I and mean, yes, there's more than enough reason to infer that this is true, and you can render a verdict. But but there's also enough wiggle room that if I don't, and this is why the most important thing you do in jury trials is select your jury. The reason why that's so important is, is if you put somebody in there who's already convinced of an answer, they don't want anything else to be true, then they will find that area of wiggle room and they will stand on it and they will never agree with the other jurors because they really should never have been on that jury to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that's what both sides try to do is make sure we don't impanel anyone who's already convinced of one side or the other before we start. Mm -hmm. We want people who are open at least and who are willing to lay down their biases. And I think the same thing is true here. I kind of say it this way, and we might have talked about the last time we were talking to each other, but mm-hmm. you know, all of science asks these critical questions that investigators ask. They're the, 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 the six questions, right? You know, what? What happened? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? How did it happen? You know, these are questions we ask, right? And mm-hmm. all science does this, all right? But there's one question that science refuses to ask in our generation, and for about 150 years now, that it used to ask regularly. So you can ask what, why, when, how, where. Those five questions, you could ask those all day long. But until you ask, you, nobody will go to jail, by the way, on any homicide I've worked if all I do is ask the what, why, when, how, and where questions. Hmm. I have to ask eventually a who question. Who did it? Now, what science has said is that we, we, we rule out who questions. We don't ask those kinds of questions. Hmm. There is no who in the natural realm. Right. There's just what's yeah. and how's. So, so, but, but, but what, if all the, what if all the evidence, though, points to mind or points to design or points to information and intelligence? Mm-hmm. What do we do then? Why would we, why, if all the evidence, if I go into a, a, a crime scene and there's blood spatter on the wall, and I'm not sure this is even a homicide. Well, I can explain the blood, blood spatter with just physics. He might have cut himself accidentally, fallen accidentally. That blood spatter could just be physics that caused that mark on the wall. But if I get in there and said, and I've got in the victim's blood a message that says he deserved this. Yeah. Well, now the, the best inference is I got a who. I, I mean, physics can't an- explain that sentence. But I've got a who. Right. I've got. I'm looking for the suspect all of a sudden. Well, why? Because I have allowed myself to ask a who question. Hmm. But what if I said, you know what? There is no who. It's always going to be a what. Well, now I'm going to develop some theory on how I can explain this message on the wall. Which yeah, I can develop a theory. It won't be satisfying. But I can twist and turn and develop this theory. But why am I doing that? Well, only because I presupposed there was no who question available to me. Right. Mm. And now for thousands, you know, for, for yeah. hundreds of years, yeah, right. uh, people were asking who questions as scientists. As a matter of fact, scientists demonstrated God's existence. You know, they, they believe that God was a mover in this game. But now we've decided we're not going to ask any who questions, and that's why we end up where we are. Yeah, I, I think uh, an objection to the who argument, and I would really like to get your take on this, is uh, commonly whenever we're giving these objections for design, um, I'll hear, well, what you're doing is just using the God of the gaps argument. Um, and so I would really like your response to that, and, and, and also if you could clarify what the God of the gaps argument is uh, in terms of just the atheist perspective. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be the same, though, because what if I went into that, that crime scene, right? And instead of having blood spatter, I have the message written in blood. Mm-hmm. Could, couldn't they make it like, oh, I can explain. you're just jumping to the suspect of the gaps, uh, gaps out argument. Yeah. You know, you, you can't explain this with natural science yet, so you're just going to jump to a suspect. Then. Right. Well, no, I, that's not that, actually. I think because I see information on the wall, the most reasonable inference in all of our practical experience is that information always comes from intelligence. Yeah, and so the evidence is pointing me in that direction. It's not mm-hmm. that I'm; it's pointing me somewhere else. But I, I want to jump over to the, to the God to that solution or the mm-hmm. suspect solution in this case. It's not a suspect of the gaps argument. Right. It's actually the most reasonable inference from evidence argument. Mm-hmm. That's what we're doing over here. It's yeah. very very similar. So that's this. I think actually this approach removes all of the God of the gaps arguments because what it comes down to is you're at a place where you have all of those elements in place that can only be explained by mind. Mm-hmm. You can't explain them any other way. You can't get through irreducible complexity any other way. You know how they try to do that with the bacterial flagellum? There's this small molecular machine called a type 3 secretion system that has some similarities. But it is also irreducibly complex to 30. And by the way, the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex to 40. 40 mm-hmm. pieces have to be in place simultaneously before it works. Wow. Now think about that for a second. Yeah. They have no molecular pathway from zero to 40. Now they find other similar objects in nature, but we also have dated those objects molecularly and they are not 
um, older than the bacterial flagellum. The bacterial flagellum is the older object. So this is not a, a, an example of evolution from 30 to 40 in a, in a machine. It's a, a, an example of devolution from 40 to 30, mm-hmm. which we actually can explain <laughs> from our Christian worldview. We're in a worldview which entropy in a fallen world is acting on everything, including biology. Hmm. So I think you can explain that. But the problem I, I, I see as I look at it is that you, if you see one design object and you're arguing that it came from another obviously designed object, that's not going to help your argument. You know, because it's not as though, how do you explain the type 3 secretion system? How did that get here? Right. And by the way, it's very different in terms of its functioning and the way these proteins are, are actually functioning in the machine. So I think it's not, it's not going to be offered. By the way, that, that, that has been responded to, Behe has responded to that over and over and over mm. again. That will not explain the bacterial flagellum. Mm-hmm. And that the problem is there really isn't. So what's happening here is that, that the naturalist has to say, well, look, we don't have an explanation for that yet. And by the way, they do this with everything, with the origin of the universe, with yeah. the fine-tuning in the universe, with the appearance of, of the life in the universe, with mind and free agency. You know, we don't have a, a coherent explanation for this, but we know it has to be natural. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a you know, that's, that's exactly the science of the gaps. You're saying, hey, we don't have an explanation, therefore science. Right. Mm-hmm. How is that any mm-hmm. different than saying we don't have an explanation, therefore God? Right. Ah. So I think it's a very that's similar good. kind of dilemma that we find ourselves in. Yeah, that's good. And, and how is the, the scientific community right now embracing the intelligent design movement and as well for the people who hold to naturalism mm-hmm. or to the classical neo-Darwinism? Uh, is, is there sort of a shift in the in the movement right now that you could kind of start seeing where maybe there's a little acceptance of, hey, maybe we got this whole thing wrong as materialist and maybe you know there is an intelligent design but they don't want to go that far yet um well okay i am not seeing it but i will i am seeing this i am seeing that people are um starting to question the the absolute uh, mechanisms of of neo darwin uh, neo darwinian theory or just darwinism in general mm. because they see that it doesn't explain certain phenomena and there are some problems in the theory but they aren't saying therefore we are now going to look at design as a, as a realistic option i think they they would still com- see themselves as committed naturalists who just need to tweak the paradigm and they would say that's perfectly appropriate and i would agree because all of these scientific theories are theories that cha- that are, have to be tested and when we find them wanting we start to develop or refine the theories to make it more robust Mm-hmm. That's just a scientific pro, uh, you know, project, and I have no problem with that. Because I'm not an a, 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 a anti-science person. Right. I think what happens is, is that science is the, the chief way that we develop the fact set from which we draw inferences. Hmm. So, so science has got great value to both us as believers and to non-believers because it's the manner by which we gather evidence. Mm-hmm. But making an inference, that's a whole other project. And that involves philosophy, that involves a, a, where your presuppositions are, that involves an, what you like, what you don't like, what you, it involves a bunch of other stuff. So what I, what I find this problem is, is we have a, a tendency to say that once we find a fact, we start to call our inferences facts. So we'll say the fact of evolution. Well, mm-hmm. even if evolution is true, I'm not saying it is, but even if it was true, it wouldn't be the fact of evolution. It would be the inference from facts. Mm-hmm. It, it, the theory is an inference from the facts we develop. Now, I'm looking at the exact same facts. I think there's a better inference. Mm-hmm. But we're both looking at a set of facts, and then from those facts, we're drawing an inference. But don't confuse these two things. Mm-hmm. The facts are just the data we develop by doing good science. But how we interpret the facts, so science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. And right. so remember that, because the science might tell you something that I, I look at that inference and I go, no, I don't think. By the way, this happens at every jury trial. At every jury trial, let me tell you what happens. We, we bring up a set of facts for the jury, and we will list, you know, six weeks of evidence that we will present in front of a jury. When the defense gets their turn, they don't present another six weeks' worth of evidence. They don't pr- usually present any new evidence. Instead, they produce new experts hmm. who draw different inferences from the evidence the jury's already seen. Hmm. So clearly they know there's a difference between facts and inferences. They'll say, hey, yeah, well, you see all, all those facts you found, his DNA at the crime scene? Well, we've got an expert who will explain that a different way. Hmm. And so jurors then have to d- kind of adjudicate between the experts. Which expert do we trust? Right. We see the facts. Everyone agrees the facts are in there. They're already settled. Okay, fine. Now the question is, which inference is better? And that's what we do as jurors all the time. And then guess who's in the jury pool? It's just regular folks like you and me. There's no reason to think you are not smart enough 
even though you're not an expert, trust me, we don't put experts on our jury. We let experts testify, but then regular folks, just regular jurors, get to decide which of these experts is crazy, <laughs> which of these experts is, <laughs> is telling us something true and which is not. And that's, it's okay to, to be able to do that. And by the way, we are fully capable of doing that. It's simply a matter of uh, just following the, the, the clues or the facts to where they lead and making the most appropriate inference from that, right? I mean, it's, it's like uh, the, the crime scene that you described. You know, if you, were, if you refuse to go outside of the room, so to speak, uh, to, to find out who was, you know, who was responsible for this, uh, you'd never solve the crime. No. But because yeah, you, right. you are willing to go outside the room, and, and that's the most appropriate inference to make, you were able to actually solve the crime. Yeah, well, we, we didn't quite talk about that, but that's how we started this whole thing in the book, right? We said, hey, when you're looking at a death scene and trying to figure out if it's a murder, you're trying to figure out, can I explain everything that's in the room by staying in the room with just the victim? Did mm-hmm. just the victim cause this? He was alone when it happened? Right. There's nobody else in the room with him? Or is there evidence in the room that is best explained by a cause that's now outside the room? Right. Well, that's what we're doing in the universe. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff in the natural universe, but how do we explain it? Can we explain it by just staying in the room with just space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry? Maybe. Right. Or is a better explanation outside the room? That's right. what we're doing here. Yeah. Right, right. And you, we even have Richard Dawkins saying, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, the, the right. appearance, the oh. appearance. I mean, that that the, you're talking about a gentleman who is just looking, refusing totally in the room yeah, and he's exactly. suppressing the truth in his unrighteousness, yeah. refusing to go outside the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Refusing, that's right. That's right. So, so and that's a lot of it, right? So, people will say that the appearance of design in biology, the appearance of fine tuning in the universe, is rather non-controversial. Mm. But what causes this appearance? He, his argument is that something entirely natural. Something with nothing more than than time and uh, space, matter, uh, acting on by physics and chemistry could eventually give you a what is it really a, not a true perception? It's, it's the appearance of design when in fact it's not that there's a watchmaker. He would say it's the blind watchmaker. Mm-hmm. It's that, that the natural processes end up always presenting us with things that have the false appearance of design. Well, okay, look. It, it, then the evidence ought to be. In, if you're saying, for example, that I don't really have a conscious mind. I seem to, and you're saying you don't make free decisions with your conscious mind, that these are actually just illusions caused by your physical brain, which was predetermined to cause these illusions. This is Sam Harris's uh, uh, Mm -hmm. argument, for example. If that's your argument, well, then you're asking me to abandon the evidence of my common experience for your theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm willing to do that, but boy, the evidence is going to have to be really good in order for me to abandon the evidence of my own experience, my own common sense judgment. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's happening here. We have a common sense judgment that people are asking us to abandon for a theory which is really doesn't work. But even if you thought it did, it's not easy. It's a complicated theory. But to be honest with you, it has lots of of, of gaps you're going to have to jump across. Well, if you want me to embrace that theory, you're going to give me a lot more evidence than this yeah mm-hmm. right right oh it, man it appears like a hammer but it's not <laughs> yeah, a hammer right. that was used. That's right yeah, exactly <laughs> so if you know if you know what a hammer looks like and you're like going dang i got two nails in that laying next to it that sure looks like a hammer to me. <laughs> no it's actually not okay well then you have to make a case and it's not to be really strong in order for me to abandon my comp and by the way you know what we do in jury trials we don't have a complicated epistemological uh, system that we <laughs> yeah. put in place like like bayesian logic or any kind of formula we say, hey, plug in these data points, and then you do this calculus, and at the end, you're going to get a verdict. Instead, we have this crazy formula we give jurors. Here's what we tell them. We say, juries, go back into the jury room and use your common sense. Hmm. Common sense is the only thing we ask jurors to use. No complicated formulas for knowing a certain fact, given all the possible potential pro- you know, potential uh, um, answers to this problem. There's not a theory. There's not a, a, a calculus we can do in, that's in, in formula form. It's just go back and use your common sense. So right. if your common sense tells you, wow, this looks like it's designed, why are you beating your common sense up and, tr- and trying to ignore your common sense? Yeah. I think it's okay. Now, listen, you make a decision in every jury trial based on the information you have today. You can say, well, maybe maybe the science will change. Maybe it'll be another finding a year. From, okay, fine. You can change your mind later. But right now, 
everything seems to point to design. So in the moment right now, if you're on a jury, you're going to be asked to make the decision not right, not based on what evidence might appear five years from now. Right. That's what we have an appeals process for. Right. So so make the decision now based on the information you have now. And if that's the case, you're going to be stuck with with the inference for design. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, what a great podcast this was. That was, this, that was, this was excellent. Very informative. <laughs> informative well, 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 Jim, uh, we always like to uh, provide the opportunity for our guests to uh, share the gospel with our listeners, and uh, it would be an honor and privilege for you to do that, my brother. Yeah, you know, there's a reason why we do all of this all of this work. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of it is just clearing the brush yeah. so that people can hear and see the truth that they really are um, are willing to reject, right, that they are inclined to reject this hard truth that, to be honest, if there is a God that's all-powerful, powerful enough to create everything from nothing, that's a God who has the power to eliminate imperfection. Mm-hmm. And he's created us. But if we want to be united to a, we're not we don't worship a good God. We worship a perfect God, a mm-hmm. morally perfect God. There's a category difference between us and God. Yeah. So for us to be united to God, we are never going to do it on our own works or on our own merit, because on my best day, I might be good, but I'm never perfect. I've yeah. never been perfect for a minute. So there's the problem. How do we unite an imperfect creation with its perfect creator? Well, if, you know, he's a perfect God. He's also all-loving in a perfect way, and he's provided us with a path. Mm-hmm. Knowing full well that you could never be practically perfect, you could be, though, made positionally perfect. And that would happen if you took on the nature and accepted what Jesus did for us, the only perfect man who ever lived. Mm. We take on his nature, his perfection, positionally, when we simply put our trust that he's going to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. That, that basically he was punished for the crimes he never committed, so that we could be forgiven for all the crimes that we have, been, we have, we have committed. Mm. And we have committed a number of crimes if you consider perfection as the standard we're trying to measure up against. Yeah. And so what happens is that God shows us enough about the nature, shows us enough in his natural revelation to point us back to the truth that he writes about in his special revelation. And that's where we find that, that you, if you read about Jesus in the New Testament, you will eventually determine that the, 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 the Gospels are telling us something true. But if you will just read what it says about you, you will find yourself to be in need of a Savior. Because mm-hmm. you cannot do you cannot attain that level of perfection. And there's so much that you know in your life. You know right now, just listening. You know your fallen condition. You know who you really are. And you're embarrassed of those things. You, there's stuff about your life you don't want anyone to see, but well, God sees all of it. So how do you make amends for those things? Well, you take on the forgiveness that's offered by God. God didn't send a man to save you. That would be kind of cruel. One person dies to save another. No, God sent himself. He died on that cross to save you. That's an offer that's really good, and it's really hard to miss. So for me, if you're listening, uh, that was the first decision I had to make, is is this true? Hmm. Is there there enough reason for me to believe that this guy rose out of the grave, Hmm. uh, that God exists, that God is the designer of the universe? If there is, then the question becomes, well, I'm crazy this way. If, 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 If someone rises from the grave, I have a tendency to listen to them. And what he told us was, is that he is the what, the way, the truth, the life. He is the one way to the Father. So I decided to put my trust that, that, that God came and did something for me that I could never do for myself, because he cares enough for me that he came down and, and took on the form of a human so that he could live that life in front of us. Send the beacon up. To tell us how to do it. Tell us, tell us what is going to be required. And then die on that cross, paying the penalty for our sin. We get credit for that penalty mm-hmm. if we simply put our trust in Christ. Mm-hmm. That's the gospel in a nutshell from a very uh, kind of unorthodox detective perspective. <laughs> but my point is that, that that's really where I was at some point. I, was, I believed that it was true. And then I believe, put my trust in it. Because I read, number one, what does it say about Jesus? Checked all that out. Then number two, what does it say about me? And it was convicting. Yeah, yeah. It was convicting. I defy anyone to read uh, Romans with an open uh, heart <laughs> to their own condition and not be convicted by it. If you right. are convicted by that, go read First John. Right. Yeah. If you're a Christian, go read First John. Yeah. So you're going to find yourself convicted on a daily basis that you are in need of the gospel, not just once, but for you know, uh, every day. I need the gospel. I need the cross every Amen. day. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, Jim, it was a pleasure to have you back on again. You're always one of my favorite guests to bring on, and uh, you've been uh, just a a blessing to this ministry. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks, brother. I appreciate the opportunity as well. We'll do it again. I know. We'll do it again. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course, of and course. And I just want to bring up, too, the fact that uh, these books that we're talking about on these podcasts are really available for children as well. You mm-hmm. know, so if you're, you know, somebody who's homeschooling or, you know, just want to provide with provide your children with the uh, the evidence for intelligent design, there are several books that are geared towards kids, mm-hmm. and they're excellent, By excellent well. resources. Yeah. Yeah, that's been the greatest joy for us, I think, honestly, is, is producing the kids' books, because uh, just to see kids use them the way they have, oh sure. my gosh, yeah. who would have who would have guessed that would happen? But yeah, it's been a great joy for us. Good. Right, right. I actually just saw a video of our, our friend, and he actually came up to do a conference down here, Eric Hernandez, and I saw that yes. you, you and him met, and uh, you actually, he, he, he was actually telling me that he was using uh, your book to... Uh, to uh, read to his daughter, they were reading it together and they were learning apologetics together, and that that's awesome. That's super cool to, to see. It's never too I know, early. It's a weird. It's a weird idea that you can um, even do apologetics at a kid's level. I've <laughs> tried to do that. Lee Strobel has written a number of great books as well, and what he tried to do is write fiction that would keep them turning the page, right. and then the under the uh, the substructure for that fiction is the the gospel and all the evidence for Christianity. So sure. we're trying to do two things. You know, number one, engage and entertain, mm-hmm. but at the same time, educate, and that's the kind of the tricky balance we've been trying to do with our kids books that's yeah. awesome well, they're great they're great great books all right Thanks, ladies man. all right ladies and gentlemen um well if you like this podcast please subscribe uh you could visit us at www.bridgebookstexas.org to find out more information about us uh we would really like for you to prayerfully consider uh, giving and, and donating to us and supporting us. Uh, you can find out more again on our website, and uh, we're just a ministry that is dedicated to discipling and equipping Christians and and what they believe and why they believe it. And uh, you know, your support really provides the ministry and allows us to to do what we're doing right now, which is bringing on guests to do ministry work not only in our community but also out into the nations. And uh, we just greatly appreciate it. Please subscribe. Uh, next week we have the president of. Reform Theological Seminary coming on, Dr. Legan Duncan. He's going to come on and talk about covenant theology. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. As always, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Later.